I call the meeting of the Environment and Natural Resources Finance and Policy, Policy uh -huh. Committee to order. A quorum is present. Uh, Representative Burkle, have you looked at the minutes for March 15th? I have looked at the minutes. I move their approval. Representative Burkle moves the minutes for March 15th, 2023. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, say no. The motion prevails. The minutes are adopted. So, members, we are going to do, I had mentioned at the last meeting there were a couple bills that we were okay. holding over and we're going to try to move uh, separately. We've already had testimony on those. Uh, so I will move House File 2324. It received a full hearing with public testimony on Tuesday, March 14th. As previously announced, the committee will be limited to amendments and final action. I will move that House File 2324 be re-referred to the Ways and Means Committee. This <coughs> is the uh, Drill Corps Library funding, and we'd like to try to run that separately. Representative Heinzman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Let's, let's go. So I need to ask this officially, uh, if there was a consent uh, calendar uh, operating, would you be supportive or would you be willing to speak on the floor in favor of this, of moving this separately? Uh, I'd be willing to speak in favor of this moving separately. Okay. Any other questions, members? Any other questions? Um, I renew my motion in House File 23B20, 2324 be re-referred to the Ways and Means Committee. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed say nay. Ayes have it. Amendment is adopted. Next up is the Bowser um, bill. I will renew. I will move House File 1828. Uh, House File 1828 received a full hearing with public testimony on Wednesday, March 15th. As previously announced. Uh, the committee will be limited to amendments and final action. We did talk uh, that Bowser had a, I don't know if Mr. Jashke's here, had recommended an amendment. Uh, so I will move that House File 1828 as amended be recommended to be re-referred to the Ways and Min Means Committee. It is now back before the committee. And I have the A2 amendment. And I will, uh, Move the A2 amendment to get the bill in the form I would like. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed say nay. The A2 amendment is adopted. Any questions from members? And again, Mr. Jashke is here. It's available for questions. Any questions? Can I just take two seconds? Yep, Representative Scrabble. Look, I just want to... The district or the district's delegate must conduct site inspections of it. So. And Representative Scraba, so that was uh, in the previous bill, that was a rule uh, that was being proposed to be a change taken out as a rule. And so what we're doing is codifying that as a statute rather than the rule. We repealed uh, a bunch, we're repealing a bunch of rules, but this was one making sure it's clear that the soil and water districts have the ability to inspect a, a conservation practice on a site. Okay, that's, I, I, I was just curious. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mm -hmm. Representative Heinzman, are you supportive of this moving separately? That was a nod, but not, I didn't, I didn't hear an audible nod. There. My nod was on the record, Mr. Chair. <laughs> Audible nod, yes. So um, I will renew my motion that House File 1828, as amended, be re-referred to the Ways and Means Committee. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, say no. Motion prevails. Uh, next up, uh, Representative Curran. Uh, House File 2304, issuance authorized and modification of water use permits. Representative Fisher, would you like to move House File 2304 be re-referred to the Ways and Means Committee? Yes, uh, Chair Hanson, I'd like to move House File 2304 be uh, moved to the Ways and Means Committee. And uh, I believe, Representative Cran, you have an author's amendment. Representative Fisher would move that, if that's correct. I'd like to move the author's A1 amendment. And if you... And also there's uh, some 
uh, verbal that's going to be coming on that. Uh, would you like? How would you like us to deal with that? Um, Representative Fisher moves the A1 amendment to give the bill in the form the author would like. Ms. Taylor, do you have the technical corrections to incorporate into the amendment? Mr. Chair and members, the amendment to the A1 would read on line 2.3, delete the colon. Line 2.4, delete one. On line 2.5, delete the semicolon or and insert a period. And then delete lines 2.6 through 2.8. Then on line 2.1, after C, insert except as provided under paragraph B, comma. Mr. Curtin, is that your intent? Yes, Chair, that is my intent. Yeah. Representative Fisher renews uh, the A1 amendment mm -hmm. with the technical corrections. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. The motion prevails. The A1 amendment with the technical corrections incorporated is adopted. Representative Curran, to your bill as amended. Thank Welcome. you, Chair. Uh, thank you, for thank you, committee, for hearing the bill today. Um, I'm here not only in support of my district, but our neighboring communities as well. In the East Metro, we have a water crisis. The issue addressed in this bill pertains to the aquifer in White Bear Lake which is being used at an unsustainable rate to support not just the city of White Bear Lake, but surrounding areas as well. And at this time, it is significantly impacting our neighbors uh, in Lake Elmo. Most communities in the area rely on groundwater. However, we're seeing impacts on our surface water as a result of this unsustainability. And over 10 years ago, this led to a lawsuit that has since been settled. However, the settlement has not provided adequate time nor resources for reasonable water use while we search for a solution or set of solutions to this water crisis. So in 2012, a suit was filed alleging that the DNR permitted too much groundwater use near White Bear Lake, causing water levels to drop significantly and quite noticeably. The suit took five years to settle, and in 2017, the district court ruled in favor of the plaintiffs. This settlement imposed a number of restrictions and requirements for the DNR to implement. Additionally, the settlement set an arbitrary five-mile radius around White Bear Lake to amend existing groundwater permits, using no scientific methods to determine this area. The settlement also ordered all permittees to develop a per capita water use plan to significantly reduce water use. And at the same time, Lake Elmo had been directed by Met Council to open up higher density development. So these two orders are in direct conflict with one another. From this settlement, public water suppliers are required to develop a contingency plan to shift their source of water from groundwater to surface water, which we know is a long and quite expensive process and would take significant time and resources to implement. I'm not here to speak against that idea, but what I am here to ask for is for the time and resources to get where we need to be. Since the settlement in 2017, the DNR has developed models to more accurately address this issue, and the bill before us today provides us with that time and the resources needed to study options for addressing the East Metro water crisis. The bill before us today is a collaboration between the DNR, area cities, the plaintiff's attorney from the settlement, and assistance from the League of Minnesota Cities. Uh, it gives the region resources with an expiration date uh, to come to a resolution. And I would add that this is uh, fully supported. Um, it's a bipartisan effort um, from all representatives in the area. And with that, I would turn it over to testifiers. First testifier, Dan lewis White Bear Lake Mayor. Welcome to the committee and state your name for the record. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. I, my name is Dan Lewismet, L-O-U-I-S-M-E-T, and I am the mayor of White Bear Lake. I'm here before you today as a result of some extremely complex litigation, litigation that as of next month began about a decade ago. However, the bill before you in response to that litigation is actually quite simple. The city of White Bear Lake is asking for relief from the legislature to allow our city to continue to pump water at our current rates uh, that we have for decades. Water that is used by our residents for drinking, bathing, brushing their teeth, and water that's used by our businesses and other non-residential entities in our community, including restaurants, salons, libraries, even public schools. 
So we're not here to relitigate the case, but rather to educate the committee on the practical effects that the judge's ruling has on the city of White Bear Lake in particular. The key ruling from the judge as it relates to the city requires the DNR to review all existing groundwater appropriation permits within a five mile radius of the lake and reopen or even downsize those current permits. In simple terms, this means that the DNR would require White Bear Lake to reduce its water consumption to what we believe would be an unattainable level. So what do I mean by unattainable? White Bear Lake currently uses 78 gallons of water per person per day for residential use. According to the DNR studies and evaluations that it would take to fully comply with the judge's order, it's possible that White Bear Lake would be required to reduce its water consumption to as little as 55 gallons per day per person for residential use and no water usage for any non-residential purpose, including businesses, libraries, schools. So to give these statistics some context and to illustrate how we believe that these are unattainable levels to achieve, I'll note that White Bear Lake has already made great strides in the name of water conservation, um, and we've been doing so long before this litigation began. We've promoted rain barrels and rain gardens throughout the city. We've supported and have seen great success in grant programs that provide funding to uh, residents so that they can uh, aid in their water conservation needs. I'm talking about things like low flow fixtures, low flow toilets. Um, when, when the city's reviewing developmental proposals, we scrutinize water usage and consumption and stormwater runoff and collection. We've increased the number of stormwater ponds and rain gardens throughout the city on the city's property. In short, we've already made great progress in the name of water conservation and we'll continue to do so, which is how we've been able to achieve these overall consumption rates that we have today, which we feel are very good given the technology and best practices that are currently available. So in closing, it is because of the facts and realities that White Bear Lake is being forced to deal with that passage of this legislation is essential for our, our community to continue the fundamental resource of providing water to our homes and businesses. I ask this committee to move House File 2304, and I'd like to thank the chair and this committee for its time, and I'd be happy to stand for any questions. Thank you. Uh, next up, Charles Cadenhead, Lake Elmo. Good afternoon, I'm Charles Cadenhead, Mayor of Lake Elmo. Mr. Chair and members of the committee, thank you for taking the time to consider House File 2304 today and allowing us to share our perspectives. A legislative solution is supported by the cities of Lake Elmo, Hugo, Lionel Lakes, White Bear, Oakdale, Stillwater, Montemini, Badness Heights, Woodbury, and North St. Paul. Until a few years ago, Lake Elmo was a large lot, rural agricultural community in the late 90s, early 2000s, the Metropolitan Council mandated that Lake Elmo grow with smaller sewer lots and an average of at least three units per acre. Around the same time as that Supreme Court ruling, PFAS was discovered in the groundwater in Lake Elmo and other neighboring communities. We were fortunate in the contamination did not impact any of our municipal wells at that time, but in response to the PFAS, the city had to alter its water supply to abandon a well and remove any future planning for wells in the southern part of the city where the contamination is most prevalent. We have identified our future well locations in the northern third of the city, and all of this was long before the lawsuit was filed regarding White Bear Lake. Lake Elmo has invested millions in this plan and building out our distribution system from the north to the south. Due to the 2017 court ruling on White Bear Lake, we were suddenly unable to access most of the safe drinking water in our community for future wells since we fell within an arbitrary five mile radius of White Bear Lake. Lake Elmo has also shut down a municipal well due to the PFAS contamination in 2018. Fortunately, Lake Elmo, Lake Elmo was able to locate a well just outside of the five mile radius, though we did not have to sacrifice though we did have to sacrifice the soccer field to do so. We understand that recreation is important, but not more important than having access to water. Despite the new well being larger than the one we closed, DNR analysis showed it wouldn't negatively impact White Bear Lake. We worked cooperatively with the state on the new well and the state picking up 90% of the cost funded through the 3M settlement. When the well was ready to be permitted and come online, the city applied for an amended to our water appropriations permit to not only add that new higher capacity well, but also increase our annual appropriation amount. 
In early 2021, the DNR approved the new well but denied the increase in appropriation due to the court case. With our continued increase in water usage over the last three years going above our permitted level, we applied for amendment again in 2022 to increase it and January again received a denial from the DNR citing the White Bear Lake District Court ruling case. Lake Elmo's current appropriation amount of 260 million gallons was approved in 2014, over nine years ago. Around the 2013-14 timeframe, the city began approving plats for the mandated sewer growth since that time, we've added 1,700 new homes, 300 apartments, and a number of new businesses. We can't continue without an increase in an appropriation amount when we have this much growth. We can't move our wells outside the five mile radius without having to deal with PFAS. We need the legislature to help us manage through these conflicting directives, not only from state agencies, but the state courts. Data shows the lake has a long history of ups and downs over the century. In 2019 and 2020, White Bear Lake was at historic highs. At the same time, property owners in Lake Elmo were dealing with hysteric flood, historic flooding issues. Not because our lakes were full of water, overtopping any riverbanks, but because the groundwater table was so high, in some cases, literally coming up through people's basements. The watershed district had to pump water out of many of our landlocked basins and eventually send it to the St. Croix River. If only we could have found a way to send it to White Bear Lake. In contrast, you may remember 2021 and 2022 saw statewide drought conditions. In June of 2021, Lake Elmo issued an emergency watering ban. Even when the ban was lifted after weeks, we only did so after permanently reducing the number of hours a day folks could irrigate their lawns. Our staff vigorously enforced these bans in 2021, not because we were required to do so in order to protect White Bear Lake, but because we were worried about the health and safety of our community when we saw our existing wells could not keep up with the demand. Lake Elmo needs a new well soon. In 2021, our staff issued warnings and violations to nearly 400 property owners. Over 50 of these properties received multiple violations, as some, some as many as four times. Despite all these efforts, on October 21st of 2021, we received a letter from the DNR that the White Bear Lake had dropped below 923.5 foot elevation, triggering a watering ban. In 2022, we continued enforcement actions and issued 575 warnings and violations. We have increased our penalty for violators in 2023 to further discourage excessive watering, including shutting off their water after four violations. Lake Elmo takes very seriously the use of the natural resources with odd even watering, limited watering hours, and has a new policy encouraging the use of water reuse in new developments. You may also remember with statewide drought conditions, water restrictions were put in place for communities drawing from the Mississippi River. So does it really make sense that the court order only provides for the solution of connecting to surface water? However, even if you believe surface water is a solution, that will take years to implement and Lake Elmo needs a new well now. We're not looking to harm White Bear Lake and understand cities play a role in conservation. With the help of the Met Council Water Efficiency Grant, we've installed over 200 smart irrigation controllers and high efficiency toilets over the last three years, saving about 2 million gallons of water annually. We've seen a savings of three to five million gallons of water usage annually from stormwater reuse for irrigation in a new neighborhood. I don't come to you today with a permit solution to White Bear Lake issue. It's obvious it's a very complicated issue. And if a solution was easy to find, we wouldn't be struggling a decade later after the lawsuit was first filed by the plaintiffs. That's why we need this legislation and the work group authorization. Again, I want to reiterate that the cities do have a role to play in water conservation. It's in Lake Elmo, we will continue to push for water efficiency fixtures, monitor our irrigation hours closely, and the city council has added incentives to code to encourage future developments for water reuse. I hope you will move House File 2304 forward and allow new voices to be part of the conversation as we look for a way to preserve community growth, health and safety, while also ensuring the sustainability and quality of the state's water resources. Thank you again for your time and I'd be happy to any, answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Uh, next up, Eric Simonson, City of Oakdale.
Welcome. State your name for the record. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, my name is Eric Simonson. I'm with Flaherty and Hood and representing the City of Oakdale. Uh, today we want to testify in support of House File 2304 as amended. And uh, thanks to Representative Curran, Curran and for addressing a long-standing uh, challenge with a reasonable, what we think is a short-term step in addition to establishing a more comprehensive strategy toward a long-term sustainable water supply solution in the Northeast metropolitan area. There are a number of cities within this five mile radius around the White Bear Lake that have felt and frankly continue to feel the impacts of the court ruling from 2017 and Oakdale is but one of those cities. We understand and support the near term steps of providing some development relief to Lake Elmo. Uh, we support the modifying language around the White Bear Lake area water use permits as a bridge to get us to the next steps in a sustainable solution. The City of Oakdale has a deep interest in a long-term water supply solution that recognizes sustainability, as well as the necessity to provide services to not just our residential consumers, but our commercial and our business community as well and into the future. Section three of Senate file 2304 absolutely has to occur. And we implore the legislature to ensure that the steps outlined in the bill are taken to include a work group that is inclusive of city representatives in order to develop a forward thinking plan that is designed to support the sustainability of our ground and surface water sources, but is also considerate of the growth that is inevitable in many of these communities. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members for being having the opportunity to testify. Thank you. Thank you. Brian Bear, Hugo City Administrator. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chair, committee members. My name is Brian Baer. <clears throat> I'm the city administrator for the city of Hugo. We, like everyone else in the Northeast Metro, rely on groundwater for our drinking water supply. In the city of Hugo, that's it. Water from the ground. There is no other source. And that's what we need to supply our residents um, and our businesses with a good supply of safe, affordable drinking water. The way that we get access to that water is through an appropriation permit issued by the DNR. Those aren't easy to get. We go through a long process. We follow rules and all kinds of procedures. We will follow a winding path to get one of these appropriation permits. Before we can even apply for a permit, we need to submit a water supply plan, which also gets approved by the DNR. We have a water supply plan, a different one, that is reviewed and approved by the Metropolitan Council. What I'm saying is that we, as, as a city, each one of us, we do our very best to follow the rules, and we understand state water policy, and we meet that when we apply for and eventually get a permit to pull water out of the ground. So when the DNR gets sued, and there's a court order that starts to impose changes, that's a big surprise to us and for all of us in the Northeast Metro. When our permits are amended, that's a very drastic thing for us to figure out how to deal with. So those permits have been changed once. There was an attempt to change them a second time and we expect that there will be additional changes as a result of this lawsuit. So that combination of a court order in addition to the, the DNR's attempt at enforcing that court order has really led to a conundrum and that conundrum has established a new water policy, one that hasn't been approved by anybody. It set a new set of rules in place and we don't think that's right. We think the way to set policy is through a deliberative legislative process, one that's approved by the legislature, one that involves the, the regulators, the DNR, the Met Council, and the stakeholders, the cities, those who use water. That hasn't happened. And so we appreciate that process being outlined in the bill that's before you. That's the most important part of this bill is a legitimate legislative process to set policy. So we do support that portion of the bill. We thank you for your time. Is there anyone in the audience who'd like to testify for or against the bill? Anyone in the audience? Any questions from members?
Uh, Representative Curran, closing comments. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, committee, and thank you so much to the testifiers. Uh, we literally just met right before committee to make sure we got this right. So um, I, I appreciate that we were able to be nimble with this bill today. Um, and um, you know, if, if anyone does have concerns uh, moving forward or any questions, I'm happy to answer those. Um, but this really is needed to um, to give us the appropriate time and resources to address the water crisis that you've heard uh, testimony to today. And I thank you for the time. Representative Fisher renews his motion that House File 2304, as amended, be re-referred to the Ways and Means Committee. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, say no. The motion prevails. Congratulations. Next on the agenda, we have House File 2105 from Representative Hansen. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I would move that House File 2105 be re-referred to the Ways and Means Committee. And Representative Hansen, I believe you have the DE2 author's amendment. Would you like to move the amendment and explain it briefly? Yes, uh, Madam Chair, I would move the DE2. This is, members, 2105 is the 2023 lands bill. Uh, thank you for your support for the 2022 lands bill. This is the 2023. The DE2 uh, amendment is one that uh, removes from the original bill being presented some of the things that we did pass in t for the 2022 and provides uh, additional ones for 2023. We also did the request for any projects uh, from members and any of those have been incorporated. So I would move the D2 to get uh, the bill in the form the author would I would like. Representative Hansen moves the DE2 amendment to get the bill in the form he would like. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. The motion prevails and the DE2 amendment is adopted. <coughs> Representative Hansen, to your bill as amended. Uh, as I discussed, uh, the House File 2105 as amended is the lands bill. I have with me uh, Lori Klein with the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources to walk through the bill. Um, thank you. Uh, welcome to the committee. Please uh, introduce yourself um, for the record and then proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair, committee members. Good afternoon. My name is Lori Klein. I'm an attorney with the DNR Land and Minerals Division. I'll be walking you through the 2023 lands bill today as amended. The DNR strives for its yearly lands bill to be non-controversial, and each year the lands bill typically includes amendments to statutes affecting DNR-administered state land, changes to state parks or state forest boundaries, authorization to sell certain lands, and the lands bill is also typically amended to include tax-forfeited land sale provisions proposed by counties. Section 1 of the bill is amended, um, amends Section 84.66, subdivision 7, to clarify that the DNR may acquire conservation easements on lands that are subject to pre-existing easements that are acceptable to the commissioner. Section 2, subdivision 1, adds 0.9 acres to Frontenac State Park to facilitate a possible donation by the landowner to the DNR. Section 2, subdivision 2, Add 77.7 .7 acres to William O'Brien State Park to facilitate a possible acquisition of the parcel. Section 3 adds approximately 30.72 acres to Riverland State Forest in St. Louis County that were inadvertently omitted from the forest boundary when Riverland State Forest was created in 2021. The sections of proposed sales of DNR administered state land in the bill include the following provisions. Section four, which authorizes the sale of approximately 0.061 acres of riparian land in Aiken County, which was acquired by the state when a road was vacated. And this proposal is, is to resolve a trespass issue. Section 5 authorizes the DNR to sell approximately 1.2 acres of riparian land in Becker County. 
The topography and adjacent road make it difficult to use this as a boat landing as intended and a more suitable public lake access exists nearby. Section six authorizes the DNR to sell approximately 1.4 acres of riparian land in Becker County that is not suitable for public boat access. And a boat landing site is maintained in another location on that lake. Section nine authorizes the DNR to sell approximately 0.17 acres of land in Crow Wing County by private sale to resolve an encroachment. The tax parcel borders Borden Lake, but the portion of the land to be sold does not border the lake. A similar version of this sale is in the now enacted 2022 lands bill, but it is included here to clarify that the tax parcel borders water, although the portion to be sold does not. Section 11 authorizes the DNR to sell approximately 0.25 acres of riparian land in Candy Yohai County that is a small isolated parcel no longer used for fish management purposes. And section 20 authorizes the DNR to sell approximately 0.06 acres of riparian land in Sherburne County by private sale to an adjoining landowner for less than fair market value to resolve a trespass. This provision was also um, in the now enacted 2022 lands bill, but is included here to correct the legal description, which resulted in a very slight increase in acreage. The lands bill also includes tax forfeited sales proposed by certain counties and the DNR has reviewed these provisions and the DNR does not have concerns about them. Section seven and eight authorized Beltrami County to sell a portion of two parcels of certain tax forfeit land. These are approximately 0.25 acre and 0.02 acre. And this, this will be authorized for a private sale. Section 10 authorizes Itasca County to convey approximately 40.5 acres of tax forfeited land by private sale. Section 12 authorizes Kuchichin County to sell certain tax forfeited land, which is approximately 200 square feet by private sale. And sections 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, and 19 authorize St. Louis County to convey certain tax forfeited lands by private sale. Section 21 provides that sections 13 through 19, which are the St. Louis County provisions, as well as section 20, which is this DNR's Sherburne County proposal, would be effective the day following enactment. And this concludes my comments. Thank you for your time today. Thank you for your testimony. Um, and Mr. Chair, I believe you also wanted to discuss the A2 amendment. Um, could you please do so? Thank you, Madam Chair. And I, we're, this is for discussion not, uh, I am not moving it. The A2 amendment is a land transfer put forth by Representative Kozlowski. It's my understanding that MnDOT and DNR do not have any concerns about the transfer, but we have gotten indication, we have received indication that this may be a bonding issue. We are checking in with capital investment staff and Minnesota <coughs> management and budget. I wanted to have the issue heard in the event that it goes, moves forward. Um, with that, I would have Mr. Ritchie from the city of Duluth to present the amendment and answer any questions that you may have. Welcome to the committee, uh, Mr. Ritchie. Please come on down, um, reintroduce yourself for the record and then proceed with your testimony. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair and members. Uh, my name is Sam Ritchie with the Freiberger Law Firm. I have the pleasure of doing the lobbying work for the city of Duluth. Uh, the city of Duluth is in support of this uh, land transfer and uh, it does appear to be slightly more complicated than some of the more straightforward ones in the larger bill. And I do believe that uh, Duane Hill, uh, the District 1 district engineer uh, from Duluth, uh, who has been working very closely with the city on this transfer is here as well uh, to explain um, the, a little bit of the complexity and I would be ecstatic to turn the hot seat over to him if he would like to come up at this time. Welcome to the committee. Um, as you get settled, please reintroduce yourself for the record and then proceed with your testimony. All right. Um, good afternoon. My name is Dwayne Hill. I'm the MnDOT district engineer. work in Duluth for MnDOT. Um, this bill um, 
authorizes MnDOT to purchase a city-owned parcel of land uh, within the um, boundaries of the Mission Creek Cemetery that was uh, discovered during one of our highway construction projects in 2017. The land was purchased um, with bonding money by the city of Duluth after the 2012 flood. It, the land had a home uh, located on it that was damaged as part of the, a landslide that was a result of the flood. Uh, and the intent uh, of this bill is to allow MnDOT or give MnDOT authority to purchase the city owned parcel with uh, the intent that we would transfer it to Fond du Lac as part of the Mission Creek Cemetery. Thank you. Is there anyone else in the audience that would like to testify for or against this bill as amended? Go to questions from members on the DNR land bill. Uh, Representative Heinzman. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just confirming with Representative Hanson that there isn't any known controversy in the bill. It appears that everything is very much non controversial, but just wanted to confirm that for the record. Representative Hanson. Madam Chair and Representative Heinzman, yes, we're the, and that's why we're having the city of Duluth here to explain this. The question is whether this bonding history, how do we deal with that? And um, we're still waiting from council on that. So that would be the only controversy is the bond, uh, bond carryover. Nothing further. Representative Brand. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, to the author, just a quick question. Um, in the last lands bill that we had a conversation about in this uh, committee, there were some conversations about um, the um, Cloquet State Forest. There's conversations about Frontenac, and I've seen these in here. Does this mean that that lands bill that we had had a conversation about is incorporated in this one as well? Representative Hansen. Thank you, Madam Chair, and Representative Brandon. I think the, the DNR is here that there were, uh, when they did the legal description after we had been dealing with the 2022, there were some minor corrections. So those provisions, the, the minor corrections are in here uh, to make to clarifying what we passed in the 2022. Ms. Klein, would you please approach the table, reintroduce yourself for the record, and then please try to. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. Chair. Lori Klein, attorney with the with the DNR Lands and Minerals Division. Um, this lands bill does have a few corrections and um, I didn't note them as we talked relating to two land sales as to Riverland Forest. Um, there was no omitted provision, which now appears in this one. It was not in what was passed as the 2022 land bill. Representative Schultz. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and Re Representative Hansen. I also just wanted to recognize uh, Dwayne Hill for his good work and um, the way that he's worked with many of the partners to, to get us to this point. And I know he'll continue to do that, that good work. So I appreciate him coming down from Duluth today. Further questions from members? Representative Hansen, closing comments. Thank you, Madam Chair and Representative uh, Heinzman. I know you're on ways and means. I am not. Uh, that's where this bill is going. I'm hopeful that this could have the same uh, bipartisan unanimous support uh, when it goes to the floor. I think the more of these that we have agreement on that we can get done, the better it would be. So I renew my motion that House File 2105, as amended, uh, be re-referred to the Ways and Means Committee. Representative Hansen renews his motion that House File 2105, as amended, be re-referred to the Ways and Means Committee. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed say no, and the motion prevails. Uh, next on our agenda is House File 2833, um, and Representative Hansen, this is your bill. Would you like to move it? Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I would move House File 2833 be laid over for possible inclusion in the omnibus bill. Uh, Representative Hansen, to your bill. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Uh, House File 2833 uh, is the latest, uh, latest bill relating to uh, some changes that were made way back in the October 2020, 2020 bonding bill that affected uh, law enforcement uh, salaries, law enforcement supervisor salaries. Um, in 2021, Senator Ingebrigtsen and I had 
uh, provided for a salary correction uh, to that. And last year, uh, Representative Eklund had a provision relating to uh, setting up an additional bargaining unit. Uh, this has been a, a challenging issue over those years. Uh, I believe there are testifiers in your packet. There is a letter from the Minnesota Conservation Officers Association in support of the bill. I believe there's someone here uh, from the organization as well. Welcome to the committee. Uh, please state your name for the record and then proceed with your testimony. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, uh, Chairperson uh, and members of the committee for the opportunity to testify this afternoon on House File 2833. My name is Wayne Haddlestead and I am president of the Minnesota Conservation Officer Supervisor Association. I am a lieutenant with the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources Division of Enforcement and I have been a conservation officer since 2001. I'm here today on behalf of the lieutenants, captains and majors of the Division of Enforcement. Last year a bill was signed into law and passed to allow state law enforcement supervisors from the six different uh, state law enforcement agencies to form a new collective bargaining uh, unit that was going to be named Unit 18. When this bill was presented to the legislator, le legislature, it included lieutenants, captains, and majors uh, from the DNR Division of Enforcement and the Minnesota State Patrol, as well as special agents and assistant special agents with the BCA and supervising agents with the Alcohol and Gambling, Fugitive Task Force, and Commerce Fraud. Uh, the new bargaining unit was pursued for the purpose of organizing state law enforcement supervisors from all six agencies for the purpose of collective bargaining. The members of all six agencies are licensed law enforcement officers and have similar and common goals related to collective bargaining and provided the group uh, with a unified front. Currently supervisors from the six uh, agencies are covered under several different plans and labor agreements. After the bill was passed and the process of organizing begun, Minnesota man Management and Budget uh, provided a different interpretation on the language passed and indicated that they did not believe the language included DNR enforcement captains and majors. The amendment to the current bill is to address uh, this issue and clarify that Unit 18 would include DNR captains and majors. This bill is not opposed by the Minnesota Conservation Officer Association and they have provided a letter of support for DNR captains and majors to be included in Unit 18. <coughs> All we as Unit 18 uh, members want is to, is to organize and negotiate a fair contract for all potential members, including the DNR captains and majors. Um, on behalf of all state law enforcement supervisors, I would ask for your support on House File 2833. Thank you for, your, uh, for this opportunity to testify today, uh, Madam Chair and members of the committee, and I would be happy to answer any questions you might have. Is there anyone else in the audience that would like to testify for or against this bill? We can go to questions from members. Representative Scraba. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Lieutenant, uh, this is for captains and majors. You're trying to get caught up. What about lieutenants and colonels? Was that included originally or where, where is that? Or are you including it now? The original bill included uh, lieutenants um, when it was presented uh, for uh, approval by the legislature, it did in, uh, the discussion did include captains and majors, and it was omitted in the, the language of the bill. Representative Scraba. Thank you, Madam Chair. So it does now just, you were included before your, your position, and the colonel, is it just one colonel, correct? It would not include the assistant chief, which is uh, um, lieutenant colonel, okay. and then the colonel, which is our okay, chief. Okay, they're, they're on... They're Representative different. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, Madam Chair. Sorry, sorry, Madam Chair. So they have, uh, Madam Chair. Um, does the Lieutenant Colonel and Colonel are on a different contract? I believe they are part of the manager plan as well. Representative Scraba. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Further questions from members. Representative Heinzman. Thank you, Chair. If, if uh, DNR could come down and just uh, weigh in, that'd be great, just to get further info on kind of where we're at on this. Welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record, and then we'll go back to Representative Heinzman for questions. 
Hey, everybody. My name is Annalie Garlitz. I'm with the Department of Natural Resources. I do government relations work there. Um, apologize for not hopping up um, before when you had called for comments. I was just receiving comments from um, Colonel Smith, who's unable to be here today. Right. Um, we have several bills up in the Senate at the same time. Thank you. Representative Heinzman. Uh, yeah, thank you, Chair. Just wanted to see where DNR was at on the bill. Yep. And so Mr. thank Early. you, um, Representative. That was what I was um, going to go through. Um, so the previous bill, or the, the previous version, um, said supervisors and DNR was okay with the supervisor piece. This bill brings in DNR managers um, currently in the managerial plan into the unit. And there are some concerns with um, supervisors and managers being in the same collective bar bargaining unit. Um, and we look forward to working with Chair Hansen um, and others on this particular bill. But we wanted to make sure that we were on the record to make note. Thank you. Thank you. Nothing further, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Heinzman. Further discussion or questions from members? Um, and Representative Hansen, I believe the bill is being laid over, um, and so it can still be worked on. Um, but do you have any closing comments before we do so? Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. And, you know, I, I guess the first comment I would make is, you know, when we make law, we need to be very careful. Uh, and when we were doing a bonding bill and putting salary adjustments in there that has cascaded uh, several years. And I, I just do want to make the point of uh, the, the payment uh, correction. There are still some challenges with that, with the Conservation Officers Association and how they receive payment. I've talked with the DNR about that. I think there are opportunities for the agency to work with their workers. Uh, here and try to resolve some of the challenges. So I would encourage them to do so, particularly on the pay issue, uh, to make sure that uh, that legislative intent. But here we are in 2023, dealing with something that happened in 2020 and then the effects of that going on. So uh, I would renew my motion that House File 2833 be laid over for possible inclusion in an omnibus bill. Representative Hansen renews his motion that House File 2833 be recommended to be laid over for possible inclusion in an omnibus bill. And the bill is laid over. Members, next on the agenda is House File 2387. As previously announced, House File 2387 is being heard for informational purposes only and no action will be taken today. Um, Representative Hansen, to the bill. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair and members. House File 2387 relates to uh, fur farming and feral pigs. And uh, it's the last bill on the agenda uh, for today, and it's an informational hearing. Uh, we heard it earlier today in Agriculture Committee. Uh, the reason this bill is here is uh, I think testimony in both committees has indicated that we have some of these animal uh, agricultural representatives uh, registrations, regulations, oversight, and response deal with three different agencies, often with different roles that were defined many years, if not decades ago. So the Board of Animal Health, the Department of Natural Resources, and the Minnesota Department of Agriculture each have a piece of some of these things. And frankly, sometimes the coordination may not be as good as it could be. So House File 2387 is dealing subdivision two, relates to the fur farm license. Uh, the current fee has been the same at $10 a license, a voluntary license since 1985. Uh, there are less than 10, I think we had testimony less than 10 likely uh, fur farms in Minnesota uh, this time. Why is that important that during COVID mink were a vector for COVID. Uh, the country of Denmark uh, killed all their farmed mink because uh, of concern with human health. So knowing where those farms are and having a response and who is responsible. Is it the Board of Animal Health, the Department of Ag, or the Department of Natural Resources? And responsible for what? Registration, cleanup, releases, etc. Having that defined uh, and also for feral pigs. So we have in this committee discussed feral hogs for several years, but now the threat is there coming from the north 
uh, not from the south. So with crossbred uh, pigs with Eurasian wild boar uh, moving potentially across the border from the north, that puts our hog industry at threat. So the same issues of who's responsible for what with these agencies, what we're doing is tasking uh, the department or the Department of Ag, but in or the Department of Natural Resources in cooperation of Animal Health and Commissioners of Agriculture and Health uh, to submit a report. So it's having the agencies work together and come back uh, to, uh, to report back to us next year on who does what, when, how, and why. Uh, and so in the Ag Committee, we had an amendment that increased the fee from $10 to $100 and put in $65,000 uh, for uh, coordination, but also having public meetings on this particular issue. So uh, often the, there's a cost for public meetings. But we want to have that so that people are aware of this particular issue. And I believe there are people here who would like to testify on this, both from industry and from the agencies. I believe that's the case. Um, so don't all jump up at once, but it looks like um, our first testifier <laughs> is here. Um, please uh, identify yourself for the record and then proceed with your testimony. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Andrew Dewar, and I'm here today representing the Minnesota Pork Producers Association. Uh, happy to be here today to testify in support of House File 2387. Uh, I don't have much to add to what Representative Hansen said. Uh, feral pigs is a is a threat to to our uh, hog industry, and and as Representative Hansen said. Uh, Eurasian wild boar coming from the north is is a, a real threat because they can survive the Minnesota winter here. Uh, feral pigs are bad for not only for the environment, but they are bad for animal health uh, as far as carrying disease uh, that threatens the domestic population. Um, and you know, in my conversations with agency uh, staff and legislators and farmers, uh, the great thing is we all have the same goal. We want to keep feral pigs out of the state of Minnesota. So if this bill uh, gets us all together to come up with the best plan, that sounds like a, a good deal to us. Uh, with that, Madam Chair, I uh, appreciate the opportunity to testify. Thank you, Mr. Dewar. Um, is there anyone else in the audience who would like to testify for or against this informational hearing? Hello, welcome to the committee. Please identify yourself for the record and then proceed with your testimony. Good afternoon. For the record, Pat Rivers, Deputy Director for the Division of Fish and Wildlife at the Minnesota DNR. Uh, Minnesota DNR is looking forward to working with the Department of Ag to further uh, our actions to keep Minnesota feral hog free. So we look forward to uh, to working with them and support the bill. <coughs> Thank you. Is there further testimony from the audience? Uh, with that, we will go to member questions. And first on my list is Representative Brand. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Madam uh, Chair. Uh, uh, two questions for the author of the bill. On subsection three under permits, um, according to the legislation, we are canceling commercial purposes. Does that mean we are no longer going to issue permits for commercial raising of mink in Minnesota? Representative Hansen. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. So this is for restricted species. So that is not the mink. It is the Eurasian wild boar. So we want to eliminate that. Any clarification, anything, um, no, no wild boar. Representative Brand. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair. Uh, the second question I had was, and I have a comment to that. Um, this seems like an international problem. Um, what's, do you know of what steps the feds and our Canadian partners are doing to stop this from happening in Minnesota and the Dakotas as well? Representative Hansen. Madam Chair and, and Representative Brand, um, you know, through some of our organizations that we belong to, through like the Council of State Governments, I know we've talked about it with the Dakotas and uh, with some of our Canadian uh, colleagues, members of the legislative assemblies there, but I don't know what's happened at the federal level uh, in terms of things. Uh, you know, I think during COVID when the border was closed, there was not a lot of, uh, you know, and Representative Scraba would probably know, see that, you know, that the border was closed. There wasn't a lot of going back and forth by people, but, you know, the, the pigs and how they're, the challenge with the Eurasian boar and if they're crossbreeding is we're in a very wooded area. Uh, they can survive uh, very hard to find, very intelligent. Mm -hmm. So uh, happy to follow up on that uh, with the Canadian consulate and see. Um, but I know it's been an issue that we've talked about member to member 
with our colleagues in the Dakotas and uh, as, with, our, with the MLAs in, in uh, Canada. Representative Brand. Actually, I take it back. I don't have a, a comment. I have another question, and this one's for uh, Mr. Dewar. If you could come down real quick. As Mr. Dewar approaches, Representative Brand, why don't you ask your question? Yeah, my question is, does this situation um, pose any additional risks when we're talking about African swine fever um, hitting the shores of the 48 states in America? Mr. Dewar, please restate your name for the record and then try to help us out here. Absolutely. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Again, for the record, Andrew Dewar with the Minnesota Pork Producers Association. And uh, uh, thanks for the question, Representative Brand. It's uh, the answer is 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 kind of um, it, it wouldn't it wouldn't uh, initially be a threat as far as ASF right now because the if feral pigs came in from Canada or from the south ASF isn't there yet, but if ASF did uh, did did come to our area, uh, feral pigs are definitely a carrier of that. So if it was here, feral pigs would be uh, a, make it a, a bigger threat than it would be without. Okay, that's it. Thank you, Representative Scraba. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I don't know who wants to answer it, maybe the DNR, but is there a feral hog pig season um, if we see them in the wild? Welcome back, Mr. Rivers. Please restate your name and then uh, help us out here with feral hog season. Sure, Pat Rivers, Deputy Director of Fish and Wildlife Division at Minnesota DNR. Is there a feral hog program? Representative Scraba. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, no, I'm. It, is there a season now oh. for them? Um, can you, can people harvest them, or is there a program? Do you guys have anything in place or anything? Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Rivers. Madam Chair, Representative Scraba, no, we do not. And actually, not having a season is actually a way to keep feral hogs out of Minnesota. The state of New York has been very successful at keeping hogs out of their state, in part by not incentivizing hunting. Uh, so it prevents kind of accidental or, or intentional release. Representative Scarlett? So, I'm sorry, sir, uh, Madam Chair. So if the feral pigs come across by Roseau or wherever, and they are rooting around in farmers' fields, what is the plan for the farmer to do something about it? So thank Mr. you, Madam Rivers. Chair. Madam Chair, Representative Scraba, we have about 14 reports per year of, of pigs being feral, and we respond to that through our animal depredation program. It's a, a challenging program in the sense that these can take months to, to respond to and to try to track down those feral pigs, mm -hmm. So, which is why this uh, effort is, is important to bring agencies together and come up with a better plan for those pigs that come across the border in Rosa. Representative Scraba. Madam Chair, so the... The policymakers, or I'm sorry, the uh, between U.S. Fish and Wildlife and the DNR, it's it's like there's there is a plan or a program if they're detected to manage them to do something with them. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Rivers. Madam Chair, Representative Scarpa, correct. There is a program or a response. We do not do surveillance like some states, like North Dakota and Montana, do. So there are other things we could be doing to be more proactive on, on feral pigs. Representative Scraba. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I, I just want to make sure that there's, there's a plan. I mean, ra, ra, I mean, when I first heard you speak about it, it's like, well, we don't do anything. We're not going to do anything. But governmentally wise, you have a plan. So if someone calls in a, and sees a bunch, the, the appropriate age, the DNR COs will go out, identify whatever it is, and then you guys have a plan to deal with it. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Rivers. Madam Chair, Representative Scrubbuck, yes, we do have a plan. Thank you, Madam Chair. That's it. Representative Heinzman. Thank you, Chair. Just looking at line 2.10 and uh, Representative Heinzman, Heinzman, Hanson. <laughs> it's been a long week already. <laughs> Um, it's Tuesday, Representative Heinzman. <laughs> yeah, I'm aware. <laughs> I can't get my name right or Representative Hansen's name right, but I know what day it is. Line 2.10, I see that we're not just talking about feral pigs, but apparently feral mink and mink management. Um, 
My only recollection going back quite a ways dealing with Mink was the release of Mink in some kind of an activist effort. Is that what we're trying to deal with here? And if that's the case, um, maybe uh, enhanced penalties for that kind of trespass and release of Mink could be a part of the discussion. But uh, I would just wanted to confirm with you what's going on there. Representative Hansen. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, in the Ag Committee, we had testimony on that, that perhaps with that should be uh, the fur farms rather than just the mink because we're not talking about the management of the mink in at the farm, but if uh, they are uh, become feral. I mean, we have wild mink. That's the difference. We don't have wild Eurasian boar uh, that are native, but we do have native mink. So uh, I'm happy to work with you to clarify that, to uh, make sure that we're we're clear on it. In addition, I would just say uh, back to Representative uh, Scraba's point is uh, is somewhat unclear because you have these issues now with disease. So you may have the DNR have the authority to uh, kill the animal, or you may have the county sheriff to kill the animal. Yeah. Who tests the animal? Who disposes of the animal? The, all of those things. It's a bit of a different world than 10, 20, or 30 years ago when, when these plans are provisioned. So that's really the purpose of the bill is how do we protect public health? How do we have clear line of responsibilities? And that's why it's here because there's the DNR part, there's an ag part, and the Board of Animal Health part. <coughs> we want them to work together to get that right so it's clear who does what in the future. Representative Heinzman. Thank you, Chair. I did have one other question going back to the fees. I'm, I'm wondering how much revenue that's expected to generate and how many fur farmers we think there are out there in Minnesota. In other words, are we raising like 500 bucks by doing this or is there something else going on? Representative Hansen. Madam Chair, it's uh, Representative Hansen, it's more like $200. Hmm. Representative Heinzman. Okay, it sounds like there's more to talk about offline. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Representative Hansen, any closing comments? Um, we've talked a lot about feral hogs and uh, fur farms here. Uh, it's not in the jurisdiction of the committee, but we do have the Department of Natural Resources has, has a role. So uh, uh, Chair Vang uh, and, and I will be working on this uh, and uh, hopefully that we can get this clarified uh, for Minnesotans ask for your support. Thank you, Representative Hansen. Um, since this was an informational hearing, we are not taking any action on this. Um, and so members seeing no further business before the committee. Oh, Representative Hansen, do you have some closing, Just something else to add? Just a little roadmap uh, head. Uh, so members, uh, the targets came out today. You can take a look at uh, those. Uh, I have not studied them uh, myself because I've been running through. So we've got to take a look at those. Um, and tomorrow we have a very full agenda, uh, so we'll try to move judiciously. Uh, and then we need to probably post a bill on Monday and uh, walk through it on Tuesday, have amendments, and then move it out on, on Wednesday, I think is the, is the goal. So uh, that's the general plan. Uh, we have our target now, so we have to start uh, preparing on how we do some things. So thank you. Thank you. Um, any other announcements? Oh, Representative Edelson. Are they joint targets? Representative Edelson, they are joint targets. Yep. Yes. <laughs> Seeing no further business before the committee, we are adjourned.